All the things we've talked about is to eventually incorporate the chest, but you want to do it in the proper order. So in order to kind of uh, reinforce this, you can put one hand on the abdomen and one hand on the sternum, okay? And take a deep breath. Same thing, start with the, um, the abdomen, and then finishes with the sternum. But focus on expanding the rib cage, not on elevating your sternum and like pitching yourself back. Remember, the last thing you wanna do is disrupt your alignment. The ribs should kind of like fan out. The spine shouldn't like arch back and forth. So we want this going on, not this, all right? So one more time, hand on the uh, abdomen, hand on the sternum and Breathe in and exhale. Okay, start with the abdomen, then the upper chest, and then reverse the order. Chest, abdomen, okay? So that was very much like a, a function of breathing and just properly breathing, engaging the core properly, uh, kind of uh, reinforcing alignment, and with every exhalation, your body's naturally dropping into the pelvic floor. Bracing or drawing in is, is different. This is a very active process, so this is kind of the opposite. In this particular movement, which she's doing in, in a supine hook line, you guys can do it in, in sitting, it's fine. You actively pull your belly button in. So you picture like a, a string attached to your, you know, from behind through your abdomen into the belly button and you're allowing that string to pull it back and you're kind of helping it pull back. So another pretty good picture, like how do you show this in a picture? Well, that's how. So you start with your diaphragmatic breaths, make sure you're in good alignment and pull the belly button in. You could kind of reinforce it by um, putting your fingers at the pelvis once again and kind of feeling for any kind of abdominal contraction. but. So if I pull my belly button in, I could feel the muscles deep in there kind of turn on a little bit. So that's another exercise you can do. Now, here's the, the kicker though, like you'll see this exercise given as like a core exercise and it's, it's not all that bad. It's actually a good exercise to do, but if you have good alignment, like we talked about up to this point, you get an automatic core or trunk engagement. So all the muscles that keep you stable, upright, and that are supposed to be on all the day, kind of managing your, your uh, posture, they'll kick on automatically. If you have that alignment with activity, with exercise, you'll get stronger. You don't necessarily need to do that movement, but bracing and drawing in is a very good exercise to get used to the ability of the muscle to contract. It's a good way to reinforce things. So that's why I wanted to mention it today. All right, a couple more. Daily stretching is important, of course. Um, you gotta take stretches slow. You wanna stretch it. You don't wanna feel any pain. And sometimes you can kind of cross over to that pain barrier. If you do that, sometimes uh, you can trigger a reflexive response, like a defensive response in the muscle, and then it'll kind of kick back or rebound on you. Everything starts with that good alignment we worked so hard to achieve up to this point. Uh, side bending stretch is the first one. It stretches your upper trapezius, the scalenes, and the sternocleidomastoid. And basically, if you want, you can take the hand and gently pull the ear to the shoulder or you could just kind of actively move your head to the shoulder if pulling on it takes you out of alignment or if you have shoulder pain. But ideally you feel a little bit of a stretch but clearly there is elongation there. So we know that it's indeed elongating or stretching it. But you know, ideally over time hopefully you can get a nice stretching feeling. Hold it for 30 seconds. And you can do this say like three times per session. We won't do three sets right now. We can do one this side and one on this side. Good. 
So the sternocleidomastoid stretch, same thing, you're gonna turn, or uh, side bend the head, and turn away to stretch the sternocleidomastoid, just like in the picture. And you hold it for about 30 seconds. And remember your alignment, everything starts with a good alignment. And then the other side as well. 30 seconds per... 30 seconds per set. Per set. And you could do, say, three repetitions in that set, each side, just to kind of reinforce the stretching, reinforce the elongation. And how many times per day? You could do that a couple times per day. So say twice a day. Levator scapula stretch. Okay, so for this one, you kind of you rotate your head to one side. All right, so I'll demo it first. So I'm going to pick the left side, and then you look down, kind of towards the armpit. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. okay. That's it. So why did I include this picture? <clears throat> well, if you can get your arm up there, okay, you don't have to. But if you can, you'll put a little bit more of a stretch on levator scapula, okay? This movement causes upward rotation of the shoulder blade, okay? The levator scapula attaches closer to the spine. So as your shoulder blade rotates upward, the inside part of the shoulder blade dips a little bit. That will give you a little bit more of a stretch if you can manage it. And if you want even more of a stretch, you grab your head and hold. Hold for 30 seconds, and then you switch sides. Okay, so... Um, let's see, so rows. Rose with the therapist. Um, so, do any of you have a elastic band at home? Like sometimes, like I've got like a hundred of these things, just kind of like littering my garage and you know bedroom. It's crazy. Um, so, we're going to demo the row, but. You could use a TheraBand to add resistance. You don't need this. This is good for strengthening. Of course, we want to get you strong. But the posture is the most important. Setting the proper alignment is critical. This can offer some good feedback, because sometimes resistance make, makes you align things properly. I can tell you if I drop a heavy load on your shoulders, you're not going to stand like this. You'll probably do everything in your power to get under it. You know, you kind of do it naturally. Resistance is really good for, for that kind of reinforcement. But without the band, because we're all just kind of sitting here today without any, any therabands, all you have to do is pull the shoulder blades back. So why is this important? This strengthens all the shoulder blade musculature. That's all. And it reinforces all the postures that we, we discussed earlier. So the shoulder position that we discussed in your alignment is reinforced by this movement. So anytime you can do a row, it's good. You have two options. So right now, I just want you to pull your shoulder blades back, okay? Initiate with the shoulder blades, then the arms. So I don't even care if your arms moved. If you can't move your shoulder blades, independent of say the elbows, I actually don't even want you to do a row. You have to get the shoulder blades engaged. Shoulder blades back, followed by the elbows. Now hold it. We're going to hold it right there. We're going to hold it for 30 seconds or so, okay? Now, as you're holding it back there, you should be able to pinch a pencil between the shoulder blades right now. Like just hold it there. Now, as you feel the position that you're in, make sure that your shoulders aren't elevating, right? Everything should be kind of depressed right, shoulder blade tipped back, sitting in that kind of pocket in the upper back there, right? You shouldn't be hinging 
in your low back either, so monitor that position as well. You still should have all your weight on that pelvic floor. That's the row. Now, because we don't have resistance, you could do a series of 30 second holds, all right? Why 30 seconds? It's just, it's more challenging than 10 and more challenging than 20. The stretching is kind of time dependent. Like if you hold a stretch for about 20 seconds, you could see some elongation. A muscle contraction doesn't, doesn't really have any time requirements. Like you could, if you're using resistance, you're doing like, you know, one second per repetition, right? Like one, and two, and three. Without any weight, we have to find other ways to challenge you. This is gonna just drive you nuts, because this is too easy, right? But pinching the shoulder blades back and holding it in an isometric contraction where you can actually generate a lot of force, even without weight, that can reinforce it. So 30 seconds is somewhat arbitrary because there is no gold standard for that. So don't feel bad if you don't remember the time. It could be 30, it could be 20, but you want to challenge yourself. And you want to give yourself enough time to appreciate and sense the position that you're in. So shoulder blades back and down. How can we lift weight? Because usually it hurts. People who have cervical dystonia, we cannot lift weight. So how can we do it? Can you dwell on that a little bit? We cannot, we cannot uh, lose the weight. Yeah, so, um, You know, the, the primary theme, one primary theme today was this idea of sensory motor integration and neuroplasticity and um, that type of training. So if, if, you, if you could focus on that with any of these movements, that would be ideal. If you can't lift weights, that's okay. Weights are not essential. Really, I just want you to reinforce postures and positions, right? I want you to think about which muscles have tone and which don't, or which have been affected by disuse. And if you could possibly, like I mentioned the yoga block example earlier, where you could kind of push your head into a yoga block. So this, or the proprioception, or the mirror box, where you could kind of like move your fingers and move your hands. I would say this is more important than, say, lifting weights or applying a lot of resistance. At home, um, these are some things that you could consider and you can try. Certainly the posture thing isn't lifting weights. S uh, squatting is very functional. You're, you're doing that regardless uh, whether you want to or not in, in the, during the day, right? Uh, getting in a car, going to the bathroom, whatever the case might be. Um, these don't need to be done with, with resistance. You could just move your shoulder blades back. I would argue that we all do that whether we want to or not. You're getting milk out of the fridge or pulling the container out of the, out of the cabinet. So, it's not so much that the weights need to be um, lifted. However, if you can lift weights or apply a, a load, um, that's good. It's good for the body, right? It's good for the body for many reasons. So um, it's a kind of a do what you can kind of thing, right? There's no expectations here, and there certainly are no judgments. You do what you can with what you can, and just try to get the optimal results and try to be progressive and motivated to do it, to engage in it. Just sitting there and appreciating your position, right? Your sitting position, your standing position. I think that's more important than a bicep curl with a dumbbell, I think, right? And that's a primary problem with dystonia, it's that sensory motor integration. So those things are more important to focus on than say the, the bicep curl as an example, or, or applying like a heavy load. Now the movements that I chose here are specific because they involve the muscles that are affected by cervical dystonia. So, um, you know, that's the, the idea of selection and they're easy. Things like this are kind of easy to transfer into the home environment. We can't do a lot of, I mean, you could certainly use a mirror box at home or you could probably do soft tissue on your, your neck muscles, but, um, but like a typical movement program for the home is very commonplace. Um, the, the flies, which is the first exercise, and the diagonals, uh, they work the shoulder blade muscles that are important for the upper extremity. And they're especially important because they work the muscles that can be, um, that can atrophy or suffer from the most disuse with upper extremity function. And they're the ones you kind of need to maintain shoulder health. 
So we don't need weights with it, but what I want you to do is try to do a, the fly. So everyone stand up for a second. First is, I'm gonna do it with my left so I don't hit that with my right. But just remember, assume a good posture. So you might have to pelvic tilt a little bit, find that center position. I've been standing for a while. So I feel my low back hinge a little bit. So I'm making adjustments as I talk because I don't want to live there for the next like 10 minutes or five minutes. It's not good for my back. So I'm making little adjustments in my pelvic floor, right? Finding that neutral position, sinking my weight into the pelvis, okay? Relaxing my shoulder blades and then bringing the arm out, okay? Just out to the side like a T. So you're making a T. Think of it as a T exercise. Okay? Now don't shrug the shoulders as you do it. Relax the shoulders. So relax the shoulders. Okay? Critical in shoulder function. And remember, this is kind of in that category of the underlying factors of the things secondary. They're still incredibly important, but this isn't causing your dystonia, like, like the weakness in those muscles. It's, a, it's an effect of dystonia. So we, we need to work those muscles and this is a very easy thing to do. It, it's a relatively easy uh, thing to do. Next would be the diagonals. Now, if you can't lift your arm in a pure diagonal like a Y, that's okay. You got guys are, this is absolutely incredible. I mean, look at this. My goodness. So, if you couldn't, or if it was too hard, you could even drop your arms down a little bit like a touchdown kind of, you know, uh, position. But the idea is that you're moving in the plane of the scapula. Okay, the shoulder blade sits on your rib cage. The ribs are curved. So the resting position of the shoulder blade is slightly internally rotated like this. So you're moving in that plane. It's a very, well, it, textbook wise, it's a safe you know, anatomical position of the shoulder. It's a great position to start shoulder rehab the plane of the scapula. So you would move in that plane. You could do this, you could do that. However you could manage the movement um, will help restore function to those muscles, okay? Now once you're up there though, you have to be careful to adhere to the plan, which is do not allow your shoulders to shrug. The shoulders need to get soft, like relax. So when I do that, I feel my shoulder blade sink right into my rib cage. I feel my rib cage sink into my pelvic floor, and I feel my pelvic floor sink into my knees and my knees into the floor. Right? So right here. Yeah. Good good traps on this guy. Weightlifter. I wouldn't want to mess with him. <laughs> but for this exercise, now just relax, soften the shoulders, just draw them. Relax. Relax the shoulders. So we should feel, we should see the, the uh, upper trapezius soften a little bit. So if it's a t if you can't because of the tone, then other things might need to be done before we can do this activity. That's okay. Remember, there, there is no uh, specific prescription for this particular exercise. It's an idea. Maybe we gotta do soft tissue. Maybe we need to do uh, some sensory motor treatments. Maybe we have to use the cotton ball technique. Maybe there's other things that we need to do to uh, reinforce this, okay? But if it's a habit that can be broken, you gotta break it. You just have to drop the shoulders. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or how about a, let me see. Go ahead and lift them up, right up here. And then bring it into the plane of the scapula a little bit. Yeah, sweet, perfect. Okay, that's not bad, okay? Let me have, now drop the elbows. Get the, make the elbows heavy. Just relax, don't, don't resist. Just let your elbows sink. Yeah, heavy. Let me support your hands. Okay, you're pulling me down. Just relax. Yeah, that's it. Right there. Okay, now I know his shoulder blade muscles are working and not his upper traps. All right, let me do one more over here. Uh, uh, that's right, per the perfect squatter right here. <laughs> perfect alignment. All right, mm -hmm. so coming to the scapular plane right there, yeah. Yeah, so tight upper trapezius. For the purposes of this, not, not ideal, it's not optimal. Let your elbows sink. Let me, I have your arms. You feel safe there, you trust me? 
Let the elbows drop. Okay, so I feel that you're kind of holding them up. So for whatever reason, we would need to reinforce the idea that you could relax them in this position. It is possible. In so doing, we'll decrease the tension in the upper neck and upper trapezius. So, John, I think that it is fair that you can do two more here. Yeah, do two more. <laughs> All right, let's see. Clean the scapula. So bring the shoulders, yeah, right there. Okay, hold them there. Okay. Without my assistance, can you just soften the shoulders? Can you drop the shoulder? Oh, he did it. Okay, from so excellent tone in the upper trapezius. So it's not like there's anything inherently wrong with that, but remember, we're talking about optimal muscle function. So he's holding, he was holding his arms up with the upper traps. It's exactly what we don't want. Then uh, with, a, with a cue, boom, he dropped him. Amazing. Now you know what he's holding his arms up with? With his middle and low trapezius, the serratus anterior. Okay, rotator cuff probably <laughs> engaged and probably sucked the, glen uh, the, uh, the humerus into the glenohumeral joint, right? Seated it in its little like, uh, like socket properly. That's ideal. So you would have less chance of shoulder injury now on anything that you do in life. So good job. That was done without any um, cueing. So that was perfect. All right, let's see, so arms up, let me see. Bring down the, the sh plane of the scapula, right? Remember the, how the shoulder blade sits on the ribs. Oh, man, that's perfect. All right, so you're, you're doing it perfectly. So he's kind of softening his shoulders. He's, dry, he's made his elbows heavy, and he's using his shoulder blades to keep, to keep that, or the, the muscles in the bottom of the shoulder blade to keep the arms elevated. Man, that is perfect. So, I, Since we have the best of the best physical therapists in here, please ask question. You have Mai who has the microphone, call her and we ask John. Don't let him go. <laughs> Is it good for you to roll your head all the way around to the right and all the way around sure. to the left? Yeah, I, I would say that that's okay. Um, the one thing that seems to be somewhat constant about this particular problem is that um, you could take a real global approach you don't you know that wouldn't be considered wrong I think there are some certain constructs that we have to get uh, that we have to understand that there's this like sensory motor problem and that there could be these underlying factors like tight tissues um, but as far as like selecting the movements if it causes like a increase in your symptoms I wouldn't do it so I hate, I hate to give you that answer like, well, it depends. But you know, if you have a lot of uh, degenerative changes in the spine, and every time you do this, you kind of feel tingling in your hand or something, I would say we have to avoid that. But if you could mobilize the neck and you don't have any, any problems with that, in, in moving it in a circular fashion, I think that's, that's outstanding. Question here. Uh, I don't even think I need this. But, yeah, I got you. Yeah. Um, I, I've gone to two different PT departments that my doctor said, give me a prescription, find a PT. They didn't know a clue about dystonia, cervical dystonia. Yeah. So they gave, you know, they tried to help me, but they really didn't know what condition I have. You seem to be better versed in this. Is this unique? Because the other two uh, PTs that I went to, they didn't even know what I had. Right, right. I can answer this question. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're smart. <laughs> As you know that I married Daniel Trump, the guy in movement disorder. Two years ago, I got hurt on my shoulder. And, and 10 years ago, I brought my mother to physical therapy. Yeah. And I do think that not a lot of physical therapists would pay attention or know about the uh, cervical dystonia. I think that at Orange Coast Memorial, we have the best. If you live around this area, and um, please do come and see them. They are most doctorate in physical therapy. And then you have them for 45 minutes. In the meantime, I'm not doing the advertisement because I have firsthand uh, experience with this department. They saved my life because my orthopedics 
he told me if I don't take care of myself, then he will um, operate on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so I went here and they saved my life. And since then, I keep nagging my husband to send all of the cervical dystonia, all of the people who have dystonia, to the physical therapy because I can see that they, they get help from physical therapy. And the reason that the neurologists, they don't send the um, patient to uh, physical therapy because they feel that cervi uh, cervical dystonia is a chronic uh, disorder. So, but I personally think that you should because even Medicare allowed you 40 times per year. Yes. Take advantage of that. It helped. It helped you very, very much. And if you do have it somewhere that the, the physical therapist, not only they have the doctorate, but they have to spend 45 minutes to, with you, that you know, for me, I think, but the other place maybe five minutes and then they have a helper to help you around. So you don't need, you don't have, how can you think a helper who just graduate from high school, who go and learn some training for a few months and help you. So in here, I did receive it. And one of my girlfriend who is a doctor in pharmacy, you will see her this afternoon. She has the same experience. The doctor already sent her to the operating room and somehow she refused it. And she came to here or at Orange Coast and have the physical therapy and now she can function normally and we both own our life to the physical therapy at Orange Coast. That's why I say take advantage of John. Don't let him go. Ask any question you want. Yeah, it's oh. the therapy is a... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh thank you. I, I was going to say that um, no matter what you do, if you get surgery, don't get surgery if you're sick, not sick. You, you always have to come back to exercise or to the idea that there, there could be a proper way to move and that proper way to move will enhance your function. So um, therapy should always, in some, in whatever capacity, should always be on your mind with any, any problem that you might have. Um, even cancer. There's tons of research out there that states uh, physical therapy increases cancer survivorship. You definitely need the oncologist to treat the cancer. They are top of the list, amazing. But how many people get referred to physical therapy for cancer? It is so incredibly rare. But we know that it works because of, just like this, the impairments associated with the treatment of cancer, it results in things that we can treat. So anyways, um, you know, kind of like with this, there are impairments that we can treat, so it's always worth giving it a try. I just wanted to check. Um, I go to Pilates, which seems to be focused a lot on posture and, um, and form. Um, but I find sometimes that when my head is supposedly in the right, the right position, that um, um, my uh, tremor, dystonic tremor, uh, increases. Um, that when I'm in the position that they would like me to be in, my head just starts shaking a lot more. So I didn't know how dystonic tremor is, is influenced by um, what you've been showing us. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. So yeah, I'm not sure if you're like on the Cadillac or the Reformer when you feel, yeah. So, um, yeah, any of these positions can induce the tremor or kind of relax the tremor. That's where you can see that immediate response or you can take advantage of like a sensory trip. But if um, Pilates is great, so like I would encourage you to continue with it. If the dystonic, I'm sure you probably have tried, but if the dystonic tremor increases in that position, I'm wondering if you could find a way to bolster the neck with like, could be pillows or towels. If you could find a way to support the neck, sometimes, uh, and it's not just a matter of filling the gap between the neck, sometimes that creates a fulcrum, takes you out of alignment, and it induces a, mus a muscular response or some kind of reflexive response. Whereas if the neck is truly supported, 
you may, it may have a, a benefit on the, the tremor, and then you could continue um, a positive benefit on the tremor, and then you could continue with doing the reformer all day. So, um, but it, it, I would attempt to modify that that position. But I think that it's I would encourage you to continue to, to work with it. Now, if you couldn't find any position, then um, that's where maybe like a more global treatment would need to take place. Or could you could kind of take it back to quieting the nervous system and you know um, finding the right exercises to do or maybe it's an underlying factor that can be treated like soft tissue work can be done before Pilates or I know that won't get done in Pilates but that's where maybe like PT can kind of um, facilitate a better experience in Pilates so those are a couple options that you could attempt to utilize and the second part of the question was you had mentioned that I mean obviously this is a very good program here in Orange County but for those of us that live in Los Angeles, can, we, can you be more specific? Is it USC or UCLA yeah. or certain individuals? Individuals, uh, one I know personally, and one I just know through email. I just, just met her through email recently, but there's a clinic, uh, I believe in Torrance and in LA, and I believe the PT's name is Julie Hirschberg. Cervical dystonia is like her passion. She does like all kinds of holds all kinds of conferences. She's um, has continuing education uh, videos and is just like so incredibly enthusiastic about this. And, and and her lectures help me prepare part of this lecture. So um, I don't I have not met any therapist as passionate as her in say the Long Beach area. And she has two clinics as I mentioned, so Torrance and then LA, I believe. Then um, in Long Beach, a uh, therapist that I know, Alex Abel, uh, works at Long Beach Memorial. So she she's, oh, I just learned this about her about a month ago, but she's incredibly passionate about cervical dystonia. So she actually works in our neuro clinic. There's a neuro rehab clinic specific to all things neuro uh, at Long Beach Memorial. So if you're in that area, she's excellent. So uh, and she's like, incredibly competent. And just the idea that some of the first things out of those clinicians' mouths were, I'm passionate about cervical dystonia. I mean, I was like, so impressed by that. So. Who was the first person you said again? Julie Hirschberg. You can look her up online and you'll get hundreds of references. But, she, I, you know, she she's, appears to be really kind of like the guru in the area. So, um, outstanding. We will give Long you the information on in our news magazine. Yeah, A L Y X A B E L. Alex Abel, PT. And I believe she works for that her organization is Reactive PT. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look that up, you'll find her. Yeah. Um, and then also, you mentioned Alex. I actually saw Alex, and she's amazing. Was it going to be good? Yeah. She didn't know a lot about dystonia when I first went to her. She knew about Parkinson's, but man, did that girl get online? She did everything she could. Yeah. Every time I came back, she had something else new to do it, and I think she even went through Reactive PT to get more information. And just, she's amazing. She's a wonderful. And their whole place at Memorial for the neuro stuff is just, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think like Diane pointed out, and, um, uh, this is kind of a little bit of self-promoting on behalf of the organization. But um, like Diane pointed out, you're going to get a lot of time with the therapists in, in, in the Memorial Care system. Not the five minute thing that she was referencing. It happens in other clinics. You'll get a lot of time. The therapists that work in the organization are incredibly passionate about rehab. So Alex working in a neurospecialty clinic, and who is in fact a neurospecialist, you kind of see cervical dystonia, you know, relatively rare, but um, she became, so maybe you triggered her passion. That was her email to me. She's passionate about it, probably because of her experience with you. Yeah. And with that brain, and that kind of time, and that kind of compassion and energy, you know, there was, the outcomes will be good, even though it was someone new to her. And, and, and good good is defined by a lot of things, well, I realize. It could be, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible the things she gave us. Yeah. Um, one more comment, too, about going to a person that doesn't know about it. If you do that and, and they don't know, do whatever you have to do to get yourself to a place that, that you know. I have um, an HMO under Medicare, but if I tell my doctor, hey, they don't know, which, you know, 
I even had a physical therapist once write a note to the intern saying, I can't help her. You need to send her to someone who can. And for a therapist to do that is amazing. And then one question. Wait, first first uh, thing, the chin tuck. Yeah. Um, I've had that told me many times. But when I do it, oh, my head pulls to the right like it does. Is that a problem? Is it is it worth doing the exercise if, it, if you're pulling when you're trying to pull your, do your chin tuck? or? I, I would say that we might want to address the pulling before the chin tuck. So if you don't have any you know, neck pain or hurt, I mean, well, do you have neck pain? I do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I hurt when I All right. Yeah, so if, and then so we could kind of prioritize, like if the pain is um, worse than the pull and a, a, a tuck might decrease the pain, then you can kind of make the determination then. But if it's pulling, I might want to address the pulling before the, the chin tuck. Yeah, so yeah, the pelvis, you know, the, for every, everything below the neck, if we can get that aligned, I would say that that, would, that could be a priority, so, yeah. I appreciate the attention that you gave to me. Um, looks like you guys have a, probably a delicious lunch coming here in a few minutes, and then a series of lectures in the afternoon that should be entirely stimulating, so thank you.